All right, let's continue. All right. Okay, so Okay, so we continue with the uh, NumPy. So I want to guide you through that example step by step. The first, the first step is of course to import uh, NumPy, so that's trivial. Um, because I will use it a lot, I, um, I import it as a shortcut, NP, uh, which is fairly standard. The next step is that we need to create our data points that, uh, we, where we want to fit the line through later on. So the idea is the following. We want to create n data points um, that satisfy this equation, y equals 2x, 2x plus 3, and then we add some noise to y. So how do we do that with NumPy? So um, uh, num, the NumPy has a function called linspace um, that where you provide a starting point and an end point and the number of points that you want to have, and then it creates linearly spaced um, n points for that. So here are my x coordinates if I run this code. Um, maybe actually let's try 21, I think then you get nicer and see what's going on. So um, here now you get uh, 21 data points with a distance of 0 0.05, right, all the way from 0 to 1. So these are now our x values, and now we need to generate the associated y values. And so, yeah, you can see that uh, this is now a list of points, right? And uh, these are actually NumPy arrays. Um, so we have a new data type in NumPy called NumPy arrays, and um, it's a very fundamental data type that um, I'll explain a lot more in detail later on. So then we generate the data points, uh, y, and so here, all we need to do is um, to write y equals minus 2x, 2x plus 3. So exactly, oh, there's a, right, so there should be minus here. Um, and um, here the thing that you should uh, notice is that um, we treat these, uh, these number arrays x here just like if, if it was a floating point value. Um, so if x was a list, then you would, this wouldn't actually work. But because x is a numpy array, you can write these things. And what happens is that these operations are performed element-wise. So each element in x is multiplied by minus 2, and then we add 3 to each element uh, in that list, which is exactly what we want here, right, for our n, n data points. And then finally, we add some uh, random, no some white noise to our data. So um, conveniently, there's a function called np.random.normal. Right, so here's our, here's a sub package. np.random is a sub package. Um, and then this is, um, oh sorry, this, this is the package, this is the module, and this is the function. So normal is a function, takes in um, um, the standard deviation around zero, um, and this is the number of data points that we want to uh, pu uh, pull, and then we just add that noise to our y. And again, see here we here we have a vector on the left hand side, numpy array on the left hand side, and then this thing here on the right hand side is also um, a numpy array. And here I need to be careful now because it has to be n plus one uh, long. Oh no, sorry, this is actually correct. Ah, I need to run this. Okay, and so here's where, this is what our um, data y looks like now. It's again, it's a numpy way of the same length as our x. So now comes the fitting the line through the data part. So our task is that we want to identify these parameters a and b. This is the A is the steepness of a line, and then B is the bias. Um, so we want to find these two values such that um, this equation here is satisfied for all the data points that we've just generated. So we need to be, uh, if you write this down in maths, um, 
what does it mean to fit this line? What you actually want to do is you want to minimize the an error, the error that you uh, make. So you loop over all the data points that you have, you plug in, um, you shift this all over to the left hand side because it's only approximately true because of the error. So then you get y, the ith data point minus axi minus b. And this is this um, error, you take the norm and square it, and you want to say you want to minimize the error over all, or the sum of the error, or error for all the data points. And um, you want to minimize it by tuning the parameters a and b. So this is called a so-called least squares problem. Um, okay, so luckily in uh, NumPy, there's already a function for this, um, for solving these kind of problems. It's called uh, linalg least squares, LSTSQ, and we can use that function directly. So uh, we need to set up a matrix up here that takes in the x, um, and you can also see that the y goes in here, and then we have to, we call the least squares function. Uh, but the important part here is that the result, the, the result of this least squares function here, gives us an a and b that we can now uh, check. We can just uh, run this, okay? So now we have a and b. Uh, a contains the steepness of the line, and uh, b con uh, contains the off offset at x equals zero. So since we've, um, oh yeah, let's just uh, see which uh, print a, and uh, I thought we, and print b. Let's see which a and b values we get. Remember the two values was minus two and three, but because we added noise, we don't expect that uh, we can reconstruct them directly. So instead, in this case, we got minus 1.9 and, and 3.02. Okay, but at least it seems like our um, least squares problem is working fine. And then the last step is to plot the results. So to, uh, um, to create plots, there's a library called matplotlib. Uh, I should call it, I should say package. It's a mat matplotlib package that we can use. Um, so that has a, a module called pyplot that uh, does, allows easy plotting. So I write import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And then this plt module has a function plot, and you can just give it x some an x array and a y array, and then the third argument is how it's supposed to plot it. So this O uh, simply means it should be these circuits. And then I also have some data point, the label here uh, to show it. So what, what do I plot? I plot the um, original x and y data points with uh, as dots. Then I plot the two, the fitted lines. So here I have x and then a x plus b. So a and b were the variables that I just uh, reconstructed. And this gives me this blue line here. Uh, and then I have the original data, x and y line. Y line was the data without, um, um, without any noise. And that gives you the, the red line, which is kind of the ground truth. And then uh, that's it. Uh, pld.legend and pld.show just displays it um, to screen. And if you want, you can um, also ask matplotlib to write it out to file. Um, and um, that's, in fact, often what I do when I write papers or master thesis or PhD thesis. Um, you use, you do computations with NumPy. Then you have some plotting part of your script where you generate the plots. And then you write them out as a PDF file. And then you can use that PDF file in your LaTeX document in your, uh, in your master thesis. So the, that way you kind of have the entire pipeline um, coded up, and if you need to, you can rerun the, uh, both the computations, but also the plot generation. And because often you will make mis um, mistakes maybe, and you need to fix things in the code, but if you automated the entire pipeline, that it's really easy to regenerate the plots. Okay, so now, um, we need to um, dive a little bit into the uh, basics of NumPy. Um, so I just want to give you, um, yeah, 
some uh, fundamental in introduction into NumPy arrays. Uh, sorry, into, the, uh, into NumPy. And the most fundamental data type that you will always work with is uh, NumPy arrays. And essentially, they are very similar to lists, Python lists, um, except that they can only contain always the same types of objects in that. So in a Python list, you can have strings, numbers, and classes, and functions all mixed together in one list. With you, if you're working with NumPy arrays, you, can own, you need to um, decide on one type. And then all items in that list have to be on that type. But of course, that type can be, there's kind of different types that you can support. So integers, floats, strings. But they always have to be the same. So here's some, um, and the reason why, I mean, the reason why we have all these restrictions, because that's what makes them so efficient. And so we have to make some assumptions. Um, we are restricted, but in return, we get higher performance. So um, number arrays have always a fixed size. Um, they always have one specific data type that you have to work with. But they're mutable, which means that you can change the values. You can't change the size, but you can update the values in these arrays uh, once after you created them. So now, because they're so fundamental, um, there's many different ways in how you can create a number ways, and I'm going to show you some. So uh, one way, surprisingly useful way, um, is to um, quite often you need a numpy array with just zeros. And um, that's how you do it, np.zeros, and then you provide the length of that array. So just, in this case, just three zeros. Same thing with np1s. And then slightly more efficient is np.empty. So np.empty just generates an empty array. And um, if you call that, you don't know what the values in the array will be. So it's an uninitialized array. And that saves you a little bit of time um, with the disadvantage that you might have random values in that array. So, um, but if you're anyway over overwriting that array in a second again, then you might as well use np.empty. Yeah? Sorry, please ask again. Uh, there is dot after every oh, you mean this dot? Yes. Right, very good question. So um, this is about the data, data type. So the question is, why is there always a dot here after the numbers? So the reason is because this, um, um, these numbers here, they're floating point values. And as I just explained, as I explained to you earlier, is that um, NumPy, um, uses specific data types for all these values. And um, by default, um, you get floating point values. And just to distinguish floating point from integers, right? because if you just wrote 0, you wouldn't know if it's an integer or a floating point. So just to make it visually clear that um, it adds this dot here. So essentially, you should read this at zero, as 0.0. Zero zero, right? It's a floating point 0 rather than integer 0. OK, so um, another really important standard array that you'll be working with is um, your task is you have an endpoint, a starting point and an endpoint, and you want to have uh, x numbers, uh, n numbers in between, an array containing kind of n uh, linearly spaced numbers in between. Uh, the function that does this is called np.linspace. A is the starting point, B is the endpoint, n is the number of uh, the length of the array that you want. Um, by default, um, the um, endpoint is contained, so B is contained in the, in the array. Sometimes this is useful to exclude it, then you can add this endpoint equals false argument. Um, so then, um, yeah, it won't, it will exclude the endpoint. OK, one more is called a range. Uh, a range is similar to uh, the standard range in Python. So that just uh, gives you um, 
again, a start, starting point and an end point. Um, but here you specify how big the gaps should be between each number, rather than saying how many numbers you want. In Linspace, you specify how many numbers you want. In A range, you specify how big the gaps should be. Um, so minus five to six, step two, go, gives you from minus five to five here as step one, uh, with uh, two steps in between. Right, and of course five is the last one because the next one would be seven, but seven is outside that range. So just a warning here, uh, A range can give you um, strange results. So look at this example here. Yeah. So we have, we go from, I call a, NP dot A range going from 8.2 to 8.2 plus 0 0.05, okay? Uh, and I want the step size of 0 0.05. This is what I get. Okay, Th this makes sense, right? Um, or 8.2 and 8.2.5. And the next one would be 8.3, but that's outside my endpoint. So that's not included. But now, look at this. So now, I say, I want to go from 8.2 to 8.2 plus 0 0.1, and I keep the step size. But I still only get 8.2 and 8.2.5, even though 8.3 is still included. Okay, why, what's going on? Yeah, any ideas? Yes, so here you're hitting floating point errors. What does that mean? So um, the problem is when you work with floating points, um, they, their computations aren't exact on a data machine. So because we're working on, we're always working with discrete uh, sets on uh, computers, and floating points and it's an infinite set, um, the floating points are kind of a finite selection of that uh, infinite set uh, on the computer. So the consequence is that if you do this, 8.2 plus 0.05, um, it turns out that you can represent 8.25 exactly on the computer, so that's fine. But if you do 8.2 plus 0.1, it turns out that 8.3 cannot be exactly represented by a computer, and you end up with 8.29. Well, I should say that um, there's a floating point error happening here, and uh, what you end up with is 8.299999 instead of 8.3. Okay? And so, a, of course, um, then 8.2999 is outside um, the NP range that I specified, um, and I get this strange result here. So just uh, for you to be aware of. So NumPy arrays, any NumPy array has uh, some important attributes um, that uh, are useful to know, uh, that you sometimes is useful to check. Um, Maybe, so typical cases, you get an NumPy array inside into a function, uh, but you're not exactly sure, or you might want to test which, how, well, how, which attributes this NumPy array has. Right? And then it's useful to, to know about this. So um, if you have a NumPy array called A, then you have the following attributes. So A.data, that actually gives you a pointer to the raw underlying data structures. Um, that's actually, in many cases, not so useful. Um, but this one is useful. A.dtype, this tells you of which data type your NumPy array is. So this might give you a float. If you're working with a floating point array, it might give you a, a string as a return value um, or integer, for instance. Um, then uh, ndim gives you the number of dimensions that you have. So at the moment, I've just shown you one-dimensional vectors, but NumPy also allows you to have vectors, uh, matrices, like the images that you do in assignment four. Images you can represent as a, a matrix. If you have an image with channels, maybe you have green, red, blue, you can even represent this as a um, three-dimensional tensor, so you have another dimension um, in your image. So then you would get a third dimension. Then uh, A dot shape. That gives you the uh, a tuple representing how many values you have in each direction. Right? If you're loading in an image and you have 
1024 times 1024 pixels. And uh, then you would get this eight dot shape would be 1024 comma 1024. And then eight dot size gives you the total number of elements in, in your array. So here's an example on uh, uh, how you might want to use these attributes. Let's say you have, you get an array into, inside a function and you want to create um, another array that has the same size and the same data type um, as A. One way you can do that is you, you initialize NP, you use the NP.COs function, but instead of specifying the shape itself, you just extract it from the A array. So you write A.shape, that's a tuple, and a tuple can be used as an argument to NP.COs. And then we also specify the type to make sure that we have the same uh, data type for a new array. So talking a little bit more about these uh, data types. As I mentioned, there's uh, different um, data types that um, you always, every array has exactly one data type, and uh, but you can choose which one you want. So, and you can specify it. So any, whenever you create a numpy array, you can provide this dtype argument. So if you're working with integers, um, use np.int. Uh, if you're working with single position values, you can use np.float32. So that uses four bits per value. Uh, if you want to work with double position, um, you should work with float64. So that uses eight bits per value. And then if you're working with complex number, use, you can use nb.complex. Right? So of course, um, um, there's a question on uh, which one you should choose here, 32 or 64. Um, I recommend that for any numerical computations, it's a safe choice to start with 64. And then if you're really interested in kind of speeding up things and you're maybe not so concerned about accuracy, you could try and switch to float 32 and see how much performance gain you get. And um, just um, um, one, yeah, you might wonder um, which uh, data types you get when you uh, when you initialize, so you can initialize an array by providing a list, a Python list. And so then NumPy in general tries to be um, as clever as possible. So you, it chooses, then it, so here we don't provide a data type. So here it chooses one that best fits to the data that you provide. So if you provide a list of integers, then it, you get an array, a NumPy array with integers. If you provide a list with some integers and at least one float, then it will use a created um, data array with, with floats, uh, floating point values. And uh, then if there's an initial string in there, right, the smallest data type that can store strings and can also kind of store representations of these, well, what it will choose is it will try to, it will convert these numbers here to strings and you will get an array with only strings. Okay, so even more, I, oh, I go through this a bit faster. So uh, typical cases, you have a Python list and you want to convert it to a NumPy array. Um, this is how you do it, np.array, and you just provide that list. Um, and then you can also go the other way around. So if you have a NumPy array and you want to go back to a Python list, you can write a.toList, uh, then you get a Python list back. Um, so this one is actually quite useful. So um, there's this function s array, um, and that's kind of a generalization of, um, it, what it does is it takes an, an object and it converts it to a numpy array. Um, and um, it converts more or less anything into a numpy array, and it tries to do it as best as possible. So if you provide a, um, um, a list here, then it does the, it converts the list into a numpy array. If you provide a numpy array as A, then it doesn't do anything. So it, it doesn't kind of, it tries to minimize the overhead of, um, of the output. Um, but you can always be sure that the output of S array is a numpy array. So why is this so useful? 
Um, look at this example. Let's say you define a function, my func. It takes in, uh, has some inputs, and then you want to um, perform some operations on it. Um, but um, these operations, right, um, we already, um, I showed you that um, these operations, when you're working with numpy arrays, these are performed element-wise, and that's exactly what I want here. So I need to make sure that this A here is a numpy array. So then what I do is I call, I, I take my input and I pass it through this np.s array function. And so by doing that, I make my function here work with all kind of inputs. So I can call now my func with uh, a Python list. This s array then will convert it. It uh, also works if I just pass in a numpy array. Then this np.s array, array doesn't do anything or doesn't need to do anything. But it, I can even just pass in a single number or a single integer. In all cases, this will just uh, work. Yeah? What's the difference between Python just regular array uh, versus S array? Can you do the same thing? No. no. So, for instance, so if you just did np.array and you passed in a numpy array, you would create a copy. Uh, so that would actually create a copy of that array. Um, so this S array is a little bit more clever in that it, it checks, uh, I'm already talking about an numpy array. I can just uh, return that directly without having to create a copy of it. Yeah. So now things become a bit more exciting. We're talking about higher dimensional arrays. So uh, in general, they're called tensors. And, um, but the construction is very similar. So um, instead of just providing a single number of the size of the vector, we now provide the size of in each dimension. So if I have, this is now a three-dimensional vector, right? So imagine it with a matrix with a third dimension. Um, in the first dimension, we have two entries. In the second dimension, we have three entries. And in the third dimension, we have um, uh, and again, three entries. And then what you get is you get three, uh, you get two three by, t, uh, three by three matrices. Right? You could stack them in this third dimension. That's how they're printed out. And of course, in, uh, in Python, you can work up to, I think, 32 dimensions if you like living in high dimensional spaces. Okay, so the same thing, yeah, you can, uh, this is how you, if you have, um, let's say, two rows of a matrix, X and Y, uh, as Python lists, and you want to convert it into a matrix, then you just pro provide a list. You have a nested list, right? Uh, two-dimensional list in Python, and then np.array converts that to a um, two-dimensional array. Okay. So um, one thing that is sometimes, um, one thing that you should be aware of, this is maybe a bit more technical, but um, it's still often quite useful. So um, um, NumPy, even though you're defining kind of a higher dimensional array, in memory, these, um, the data is just stored sequentially. You just allocate a big bunch of, uh, um, so, uh, memory, um, which can contain all the elements in your higher dimension, in your matrix or tensor. Um, and then it's really, it's in the dot shape attribute um, on the array that defines on how to interpret this big bunch of uh, memory. And the consequence is that um, you can actually change the array dimensions by um, changing this dot a dot shape attribute. So for instance, if you create a um, one-dimensional array to begin with, um, so just this is an array with six numbers. So by def at this point, A is just a one-dimensional vector. But now you can reinterpret this vector as a matrix by reassigning what the shape should be. So if, and if you say A dot shape equals two, uh, two times three, so now you get a, you, you interpret the data as a two times three matrix. And if you print it out, you indeed uh, get a two, two times three matrix. 
Of course, this only works if the dimensions add up. So two times three is six, right? So you need to have exactly six, um, six values here. Right, and so the trick here is that um, you can, um, uh, just by changing this attribute, there's no data uh, copied. The underlying data structure, the, the data values are just remain constant. It's just the way you interpret it um, is different. So, um, I mean, yeah. So uh, what you can do, for instance, that you change the first entry now in our two-dimensional matrix. I set it to minus 10. Then I change the shape again turning it back into a one-dimensional array, and then I print it out. And so you can see now I've, I've got my one-dimensional array back and I've changed the first, um, the first entry. There's a reshape um, function that essentially does the same, but um, let's skip over this. Okay. Another technicality here is that um, for, one, for vectors, there's only one way how you can um, align, uh, linearly align the values in memory. But for higher dimension, for matrices um, and for higher dimensional tensors, it's not unique anymore. So and there's kind of two common ways on how you align data in memory. And there's uh, one called row major or C ordering. And um, the way you then do it is that you first have the values of the first row of the matrix, followed by the values of the second row in the matrix, and so on. And that's how it's done in C. So if you poke them in C, that's the ordering that you get. Uh, and then there's another ordering, which is the column major ordering. And that's used in Fortran. And that's essentially the values of the first column values of the second column, third column, and so on. So um, um, this can have some uh, performance improvements in some cases, but then you really have to know how you're operating with the data. But um, I think it's just interesting to be aware of these differences. So you can actually specify which order you would like to have. So there's an order argument that you can provide. I either choose F or C here depending on which order you would like. Um, and then you can also check, there's this flex attribute, um, and you can check which order you're talking about. So in, here's a.flex f contiguous uh, returns true because I used an Fortran order here. So um, the good thing is that um, even if you're working with um, orders, with matrices of different orders, um, and NumPy is smart about them, and it converts it um, if you um, if needed, um, such that you that you don't get inconsistent results. So um, here's a simple example: if you have a matrix A that is in C ordering, and then another matrix B that is in F ordering, um, and you add them up together, um, NumPy will reorder the values accordingly, so that the resulting matrix. Um, has the correct values. And so, uh, for instance, uh, so with this, re with, this, with this flag, some of the operations can be done really, really cheaply um, without having to operate on the data. So, for instance, transposing the matrix, which means that you're uh, swapping the matrix over, so to speak. Um, that's actually equivalent to simply um, changing the ordering, the interpretation of the data. So changing from a C ordering to a Fortran ordering or the other way around. So there's this A dot transpose uh, function that any um, uh, NumPy array has. And essentially what that does is it simply um, swaps the, the flag, right? Uh, instead of operating on the data uh, itself. So um, transposing a matrix becomes extremely cheap in NumPy. Okay, array indexing. So um, this is um, um, quite important also for your assignment. So um, 
and it's, it's surprisingly advanced by what you can do with uh, NumPy uh, indexing. So uh, let's start easy. So uh, the first thing that you can do, uh, what you can do is you can extract um, su subparts of your of your vector. So let's say we have a one-dimensional vector, and you want to only get a subvector that contains um, the components from the second to the fourth element. That's what you do. Um, you can also do more fancy things uh, where you specify exactly which components you want. So here, say you want the second, the third, and the fourth component. You just provide a list of the values that you want. Um, but here's an important uh, note. So the result of this, of these two operations, they are not copies of your original arrays. There is a so-called view on, the, on that array. What that means is that um, um, if you um, if you so if you store that result here, or if you do an assignment here and set this to ten, or let's say you write this out into a new variable and then you you perform some operations on that variable, you are automatically also changing the values of a. Okay, so you by default NumPy tr tries to avoid copying as much as possible, and so this includes these slicing and indexing operations. So you, sometimes you have to be quite careful when you do assignments, if you set values, that you don't um, change um, at the same time uh, another arrays, um, because both of them might be just views. So, um, okay, setting values, right? Of course, we can use the indexing and then do an assignment. Um, this we also know is minus one is indexing from the, from the right hand side that we also know. And then we can use colon to say that we want to um, have, uh, that just means for any index. So that now generalizes also to higher dimensional indexing. So, um, if we are talking, here's a matrix as an example again. So if you have two times three matrix. So um, here we can, we can set individual elements. So the, sec, the, so the way you need to read this is the first index is the row, and the second index is the column. So you first decide which row you want to take, and then the column. So this would be the second column, third row, you set to 10. Um, an equivalent syntax is to first, um, right, so this, these two lines here, they do exactly the same. Um, the way you should read this is you first create a view onto the second column, then you create another view onto the third component in that column, and then you set it to 10. Right? They, they do the same thing. The second one is a little bit slower if you, do, if you work on very high, uh, very high dimensional arrays and do this operation very often. And then, of course, uh, we can use the colon. So if you want to set the entire third column to 10, we can use this. Uh, same with the row. And of course, if we want to use all um, values to 10, then we can just use colon, comma, colon. OK. So. Um, So here's an example on uh, some more fancy uh, slicing. So um, here you can see how I use this reshape to reinterpret the data. So I, I use linspace. That just creates a long uh, vector with 30 entries. And then I reshape that, meaning that I reinterpret this vector as a 5 times 6 matrix. So I get a matrix like this. And so now um, we can get uh, the slicing to get a view on on um, a view of the sub of a subset of this matrix. So, for instance, if you want to have, um, if you want now want to um, um, set the um, okay, so if you want to have the row, the third. Now, what are we doing here? This, the first one is the row. So we take the first, the second, and the third row, 
And then here we say every second column, we set it to zero. Okay, does that make sense? We, every second column is set to zero, but only for the, oh sorry, only for the second and the third row. So this, yeah, exactly. Only for this, um, it's the second and the third row here that I'm setting zero. So you can see these two zeros here, and here we, we jump over every second uh, column, so this one is not touched. This one is set to zero again. This one is not touched. This one is uh, set to zero again. Okay. Okay, it gets even more complicated now. So now we have, now we create again a submatrix consisting of every third row. That's why I have colon, colon three here. And then every second column starting from the third column. So, okay, I have the two here. That means I want to start from the third column um, all the way to the end. So I don't have an end index, but then I have a third index here specifying that I only want to have every second one. Right? And so you can see the result here is another array here. It's a view on the original array that I had up here. Um, and then I can start operating on it. Saying it, setting it, or cop I could copy it out if I want to have a copy and so on. Okay, just um, to make this point again, so, um, the view is really operating on the original data. So if I um, um, if I create a three times two matrix, um, I extract a sub matrix, um, a view onto the third row, and um, I set that uh, first another view in the first component, and I set it to pi. I really and, I, and then so here I only operate on the b uh, variable. But um, after this assignment, if I print out A, you can see that I'm, I changed also the, the matrix A. So one really needs to be a little bit careful with, the, uh, with these views. So, and if you want to avoid that, and you really want to work on a copy, then you need to make it, make it explicit. So um, if you, here in this case, if you extract the third column and you, don't want to change A anymore in the assignment, then you can make an explicit copy here, uh, and then B is kind of a separate uh, vector with its own data vector that you can operate on. And then you won't impact the um, A matrix anymore. Yeah. And um, yeah, just be aware, so in, remember in, in Python lists, right, when you use this A colon, that, uh, made a, that always made a copy. So um, there's kind of a subtle difference between the NumPy and Python list that you need to be aware of. Okay, so then I think um, I stop at this point. Um, and uh, next week we'll go, uh, we talk about how we can vectorize loops and do more heavy computations much faster in NumPy. See you next week. <laughs>